don't know if that needs any more any more explaining, but we'll we'll leave it at that. Um, so in terms of the structure of um, of the session, um, it will we'll go through uh, we'll go through some contributions from uh, each of the speakers here before uh, going into more free flowing discussion from the floor. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we have a short video um, to show from the Young Foundation. It's the balance between um, emissions going in and coming out. There's a target for 2050, I think. Oh. And it's something I feel like I should know more about. No, I can think it's climate change. I'm worried about the children they have. It is the biggest priority. We don't um, fix it, and it's too late. I would, and people like me won't be able to live their full life. Thank you, Robin. I don't really like to enjoy. I'm really sorry for. I made out my car, and I walked to school. I'm still worrying about food on the table. Do you know what I mean? How am I getting to where? Uh... You wanted to put a heat pump here, and I've heard about them and read an article. It's so expensive to do people's small changes. The contractors don't want to do it, so there's not enough money in it for them. In my lifetime, I hadn't expected to see you have a I think we're going to have to figure out how do we break it down. I feel like there needs to be a culture shift. We don't really get to talk about anything about climate change. I'd like to make more changes. I'd like to like experience it, but. I don't think a lot of people are knowing much about it at the moment. I think while we're burning fossil fuels for anything, we're not changing. We don't want to just be meeting the targets, but we need to try and exceed them. I think that corporations have a much bigger impact on the environment than individuals do. You know, we, we can't do this on our own. It's a government's need to help. And if the things become more accessible, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What well, is about change? How unequal the impact is going to be. And that is also scary because you feel very powerless. Because ultimately, everybody is affected. And whoever is affected should have a conversation about it. That's all. Well, some very uh, very powerful issues to, to digest in that video. Um, we'll come first uh, first on the back of that video uh, to Will Walker, um, who's on my left. Um, he's a climate action manager at Power to Change. Thanks, Sam. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> uh, for those that don't know us a bit about Power to Change first, we are uh, an independent charitable trust with a mission to strengthen communities through community business in England. Now, there are about just over 11,000 community businesses across the country already contributing to stronger local economies. And there's a huge diversity of different forms out there from community hubs, shops, all the way through to community and agriculture farms, as well, uh, of course, community energy co-ops and, and businesses. They create a huge amount of wealth locally, which sticks to local economy. And they're also tackling you know, society's greatest challenges at a local level. So three quarters of them are tackling climate uh, change at a local level. And they're also very much focused on addressing inequalities. So this stuff is really in the DNA of community businesses. And on top of that, which is a relevance to this conversation, that over approximately half of community businesses across the country are operating the most economically deprived parts of the country. Um, so, sorry, can, can, you've not got microphone. Can I at least ask you to stand up so that we can at least live with you? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so, as Sam said, it's a very interesting context for today's discussion with Rishi Sunak making the speech last week. Um, and he set a very clear political dividing line um, that essentially net zero is, is not fair and it's not affordable for families. That was really uh, at its base the case that he was making. But the proposed treatment um, from the current government around rolling back net zero policies 
discouraging investment, losing those jobs, slowing the transition will damage the UK ultimately and put people's bills up in the long term. There's a huge amount of analysis to show that that's the case. What we need uh, and what we need to recognise is this, this is the greatest challenge of our time. This economic transformation is absolutely unprecedented. And the only, the only an approach that engages people, that builds trust, consent, and empowers people and communities will ultimately be successful, inclusive, and fair. And absolutely at the centre of this is building the public and the political support to get to where we need to go. And it's absolutely vital we have that. And we need to come together to do that, not divide and rule, essentially. Um, now, community businesses are basically the kind of living, I see them as a living, breathing embodiment of a, of a just transition. You know, you hear just transition talked about a lot in policy circles like this, but they're actually on the ground doing this stuff at a local level. And just two examples I want to highlight today, just to give you a flavour of what, what's happening. On the outskirts of Bristol, Ambitious Lawrence Western is a community organisation, one of the most deprived parts of the of the country. And now they have, just in the last few months, literally the turbine blades have started turning, the largest onshore wind turbine in the country, which is now fully community owned. That is cutting the estate's carbon emissions by about 35%. It's powering the community. There are 7,000 people living in that community, providing enough clean electricity to power that. And crucially, it's bringing in hundreds of thousands of pounds into that community that are sticking to that community and they're being re reinvested for the community good. Likewise, uh, in, in Leeds, Latch is a, uh, a housing, a social landlord, essentially, that is buying up derelict properties, training local unemployed people to retrofit those properties, make them more energy efficient, bring the costs down, and then leasing them out. A social landlord was leasing them out to people, low-income people in the community. They've won several awards and just completed their 100 pain in, in, in the city. Now, there are, there are examples like these, thousands of examples like these across the country, of community businesses up and down the country contributing to, to stronger economies. But there are all, altogether too many barriers that are holding these community businesses back. These, are ha these, these projects are happening against the grain, essentially. So the question remains, what will the incoming government do to provide the enabling conditions to, do, to see more of this, to unleash the community power that is out there? Power's change is calling for four things, essentially. We want to see a coherent framework, a stable, coherent framework that enables local and community climate action and that's both mitigation and adaptation by the way because we know there are big climate impacts coming down the chain that we need to be prepared for and that needs to be backed up with the powers the resources and the incentives to enable community businesses to really flourish uh, and they are enterprising and they need to flourish and they need that support so on the powers front we're calling for a landmark community power act which will have three new powerful community rights a community right to buy, a community right to shape public services in the local area, and a community right to control investment. On the resources, we're calling for an extension, expansion of the current uh, community ownership fund, so more communities can keep the assets that are important to them in their local area in, in community hands. And crucially, on the clean energy re revolution that we need, we hope that the Lib Dems will match their, uh, obviously as the originators of the community energy strategy back in 2015, We'd hope they'd match the ambition that we've seen in Labour's manifesto around a billion pounds a year for local and community uh, uh, initiatives in <clears throat> low interest loans and grants. And then on the incentives, we're looking for business rates tax relief uh, to bring it in line with other uh, incentives that, that more traditional businesses get. And crucially, to reinstate tax relief. So incentivize investment in the social economy by intro introducing a success successor scheme. Excuse me. Um, in summing up, I'd say that absolutely what we need to be doing on this agenda is to centre the needs of communities and supporting those most affected by the transition. It's not reasonable to expect the people that can't afford it to put a £7,000 heat pump in their home. It's not reasonable to expect, to expect people to be able to buy an electric car uh, that don't have the money to do that. They need support to do it. It's not a reason to slow down the transition. It's a, it, you know The rationale is there to give the support, the re required support to communities and individuals to do this. And to do that, we need proactive and bold leadership from the government. Um, we need a stable framework that's backed up by the powers, resources, incentives to unleash community enterprise. And that's it. That's Thank you. Thank you very much, um, So, um, I'll invite um, Hina Bakari. Um, Hina is a, um, a London-wide assembly member. 
um, for the uh, for the Liberal Democrats. Um, so, Tina, do you want to come in? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I'm a member of the Environment Committee for the London Assembly, and we get an opportunity to hear from the experts. Uh, we get an opportunity to hear from community activists. We get an opportunity to hear. You know, from people who are very passionate about wanting to make sure that we are um, reaching net zero. And essentially, the main message that we're always getting back from these experts is this will, will save us money in the long term, but it will cost us money in the short, short term. So we must invest to make sure that this happens. Now, we need to also make sure that we're bringing people along with us when any, when, when, whenever we do any policy uh and I think, you know, I'm not I'm not going to shy away from saying this, but ULES has been a, a, a big, big topic and conversation in London recently. Uh, and it has shown that if we don't bring people along with that transition, uh, it can actually block the change that we need. Um, you know, we need to help help and support people, particularly vulnerable people, people who are going through some real challenges because of the cost of living crisis through the green transition. We need incentives. But we also need education. We need to be able to explain the reasons why we need these changes. And, and essentially, you know, for example, businesses, for example, do need to know what does it mean by green skills? What does that actually mean in terms of how they adapt their businesses? How do they train their staff? How do they go forward in their business? Um, and ultimately, then this all then ends with leadership. We really do need leadership nationally. We need leadership from our mayor of London. We need leadership from our local communities and groups, but um, local authorities. And without that, we can't go forward. Now, if we have all of this kind of com this approach, uh, we'll be able to revive some of the uh, communities that are very, you know, that are suffering. Uh, some former industrial communities that actually need some real boosting. Uh, we can bring back that community element that you were talking about and uh, and empower neighbourhoods. We've seen during the pandemic that when neighbourhoods work together, we can make some real positive changes and work together. And we can do that by, for example, pedestrianisation, planting trees, decarbonising our buildings, making walking and cycling accessible um, and empowering local government and making sure that we allow for creative bold ideas to come through these communities. Now, one of the things that the London Assembly are going to be working on and pushing for are community energy projects, something that um, uh, is it's something that is been seen to succeed quite well in areas like Hackney, for example. Uh, but I've just uh, finished a fringe where I've heard that Cheltenham is doing fantastic work. I've got some Sutton councillors here who I know that have been doing some fantastic work. And what I'm worried about is that there are these pockets of great ideas, initiatives, successes that are happening locally, but they are small, they are random, they're everywhere, there are, you know, that we need to bring them together. We need to find a way to communicate all those fantastic ideas that are happening. Now, Conservatives obviously have done this uh, U-turn recently with their climate policies, and this short-term populism is a real worry. And again, at the last range I was talking of, um, in the there was a, a real concern that politics is actually the problem here, why we're not moving forward. Um, and maybe even politicians, I have to say, there was a, there was a you know, it was, it was, it was a tense, tense you know, conversation, but I think it's a conversation that we need to have. Um, I think ultimately it, it is leadership, but it's also honesty. It's honesty from all of us. It's honesty from the politicians who are going to be making some very challenging decisions and they are challenging because they are bold and they're going to be radical if we are to have any real change. And sometimes those radical, progressive, bold decisions can create a reaction politically. And politicians are very wary of that. And we've seen that the Conservative and Labour government right now being quite cautious in how they they talk about the environment and their and uh, their next steps towards uh, what they'll be doing for, for the environment. So what we need to do is uh, bring honesty back. We can't have a news broadcast where we've got the rhetoric of the Labour government, the Conservative government pulling back in their positions and then have the next news item with flooding in Libya and people dying. It just doesn't seem to work for me. And I don't think that people at the doors are going to accept this anymore as well. So if we are bold and we are progressive, I think we will be able to win those elections. And I think that's all the way forward for the Lib Dems. Thank you, Hina. Um, clear about the challenges there um, in 
getting the message out on net zero, but also um, very encouraging to hear some of the, the very the very positive examples that are, that are already happening uh, at the local level. Um, so next I'll invite uh, Laura Hobhouse um, to, uh, to take the floor. So um, she is the Liberal Democrat spokesperson uh, for energy and climate change and transport. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Very good to see you all. Uh, my voice is starting to give up, but I hope you can still <laughs> just hear me all. Um, net zero is not negotiable. I keep saying that now. It's not negotiable. Net zero will not go away, even if governments are trying to deny it. So um, for us, the most important thing is, as Hina says, is to be honest, uh, to be honest um, about um, the challenges, but also to be honest about if you don't follow the science, what's going to happen to this world. So yes, it is about being, and that annoying, I call it Cassandra, you know, the, the, the alarmist, the person who say, if you don't do this, your lives are going to be changed to uh, irrecognizably, and we need to recognize that. So let's just not walk away from that uncomfortable message and that uncomfortable truth that has been around for a long time, denying it or sort of trying to say to people, oh, we can't just afford it for the time being as if we can just miss a bus and catch another one, is just not an option. So um, let's uh, let's not shy away from the uncomfortable truth, but also uh, make it uh, so that people understand what it is about, what they can do. Make it um, so that people understand the challenge without being afraid. I think that is the biggest challenge. And um, uh, I, I've just been, I go from fringe to fringe here. Um, I, I heard another accusation about politicians usually um, you make messages so simplistic that they're wrong. I think for us politicians, it, it, it is about a very complex, very difficult um, issue to make it simpler uh, without getting it wrong. Uh, and we all in the space of um, political communication are called upon to get that right. And therefore, this discussion is very important. I would say um, it is very clear that um, people generally lust, uh, trust their local authorities most um, on advice, particularly. So take that into account if you're a local councillor. Local authorities are best placed. People don't trust industry and they don't trust central government, but they trust their local authorities. So a simple way is just to call for um, more funding to um, increase the expertise within, within our local councils to then sort of give the information that people need in order to, for example, understand how to improve their homes uh, for energy efficiencies or when it comes to changing their energy sources. Uh, in order to not repeat a lot of things that have already been said, I wanted to just put one thing out here. Uh, we at our excellent Bath University always have got excellent research going on. And this one from Professor Lorraine Whitmarsh about the psychology um, of, of, of climate change and climate anxiety that is now developing amongst young people. Because a lot of young people understand um, that this is really affecting their future and could affect their future in a very negative way. And it really affects their mental health in a big way. So they, this, to, on, only to talk about that, to make sure that our young people are not uh, being left um, completely on their own, worrying about their future. We have got an obligation to really address um, uh, the, 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 the climate crisis and do it in a positive way, but do it firmly. Um, and actually do climate action rather than climate de 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 delaying and denying. There is absolutely support for net zero. It's out there. People are crying out for leadership, particularly for political leadership. Let's make our messages simpler. Um, let, let make, let's make them clear. Let's not get it wrong, but let's get the message out there. We need to net, get, we need to get to net zero. Net zero is not negotiable. And um, so lastly, we come to Helen Golden, who's, uh, who's the CEO of uh, the Young Foundation. Great, thank you. Um, joys are going last when you violently <laughs> agree with pretty much everything as Trevor said. So um, I will keep it slightly uh, truncated, maybe, but I do have a few things to say. So the Young Foundation for the last 70 years, really in different forms, has been working in and alongside communities, particularly marginalised and underrepresented communities. And increasingly over the years, we've grown our work to understand what that means in the context of the climate crisis and the impact that net zero strategies will have, likelihood, on inequality uh, and poorer households. Um, I think what we need to really understand, I think we get it, right? But there is climate, any action on net zero is basically an exercise in mass 
participation. So it's mass across every single sector, education, universities, private sector, schools, the state, citizens, civil society. And the best possible job that any government can do is to create the right conditions and incentives for all of that to flourish and acknowledge that there is a form of mass localism at work as well as big frameworks and leadership that happens at a national level. That means we need to understand uh, the broad understanding about what issues we're facing. People need to understand how they need to act and the barriers for those who are unable to act for different ways and reasons, whether that's affordability or because of the type of housing they're in, those are dismantled and taken away. That feels fairly straight, obvious, <laughs> obvious stuff. But that last point is super, super important. So there have been a few fringe events here today and yesterday where you've got people talking about the race to net zero and the importance of private finance and how critical that will be when you've got a really constrained public purse. But you can absolutely see a future where we end up with a really strong net zero commitment and we have fundamentally made our society all the more unequal because we've left people behind with legacy technologies, with things, transport and opportunities to sort of um, no opportunity to essentially take advantage of green jobs and those sorts of new technologies. And that feels to me to be fundamentally important. We shouldn't get to net zero and end up in a worse place society, which is an, it's entirely probable. If you look at the history of technological innovation, it's entirely possible that we end up in that area. So our job is to try and help that uh, from not happening. We know that it doesn't happen in a vacuum. So net zero is in the context of a changing climate. So extreme events, possible disruptions of basic essentials over the next few years will happen as we're trying to make this transition. That means that we know it's about resilience and not just transition. That takes you to a local place. We know that most people want to act when it, in the context of their locality, the place they live and love. That takes you to a local place. We know that history tells us that great societal change comes from grassroots activism and activism and innovation that takes you to a local place so i think that there is there's a huge argument for community power and we're delighted to be part of the community act campaign as well um i think there's a couple of things that we need to say uh in terms of the, the big and the small so trying to reconcile the big macro changes that need to happen across global and national governments and that very sort of grassroots community power so it's a continued surprise to me, although maybe it shouldn't be given the sort of shifting sands of policy. There's absolutely no public awareness campaign of how and why we should be acting. So if you are old enough to remember Y2K or the Millennium Bug or turning off the TV analog signal, these sort of small campaigns, you couldn't go anywhere without understanding that there was a Y2K problem or that we're going to have to replace our television sets because of the turn off of analog. Um, and yet we don't have anything like that at all on any level at any degree we don't have a five a day campaign that tells us the five small things that we could be doing even at that very basic um level we don't have a one-stop shop so i can find out why i'm in need to act how i act where i can find local suppliers we don't have free audits so i can have a household audit so i can be a more intelligent customer about what i need which in itself would stimulate a much more effective market um the other thing to say is that there is um a very big and true narrative, which is that the kind of change that we need to make will only be made by big investments, big billion dollar investments into our energy, into our infrastructure, into our transport, that big people and big, big institutions need to get behind the governments. And that's really true, that's really true. But it's also a fundamentally disempowering narrative. And I end up in lots of conversations where um, community-led retrofit, community ownership, community energy is sniffed at. It's like, well, it's a bit small, it's a bit niche, it's only going to tinker around. The edge is what we need to read, it's the big people coming in and doing it. And quite frankly, it's a bit messy and a bit risky, even though actually some of the biggest infrastructure we have are far more risky, one might argue. But it's that mindset of thinking it's marginal and niche and interesting that keeps it in that place, which means you don't get the policy attention, you don't get the levels of investment that flow into it, which means that what is seen as marginal retains marginal just because we think it should. Um, so we need to develop much more local level and we need to be able to reconcile by saying, no, you can, we can <laughs> aggregate opportunities together so you can get wholesale investment and support for initiatives that are operating at a really high local context. Um, I think we would also, Maybe a final point really on um, 
uh, the need for community involvement. So even if you were acting entirely instrumentally, we know that if you leave people behind and you don't involve people in decisions, even if they're very controversial decisions, you end up in a place where they can exercise a national mu muscle that takes us out of the European Union. Uh, so, you know, there is big reasons, even at an instrumental level, why we should be listening and involving our communities more. We launched a piece of work um, uh, with Waltham Forest a few months ago uh, on 15-minute neighbourhoods. So how do you get people closer to the things that they love, want and need? Uh, entirely sort of almost benign, let alone a positive strategy. And that same week, you've got people in Oxford, you know, and being co-opted by very extreme conspiracy theorists to tell us that actually this is all a big deep state idea to keep us locked in our own neighbourhoods. You know, this is thing is real. And if there isn't the level of thickening of trust between institutions and people, they will just that there will be an inexorable draw towards that, particularly as people are being asked to make difficult decisions if they don't understand completely why they're making it. So um, I'll probably stop there. There's lots to talk about how to sort of think about different access to finance, but we'll talk about that later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, everyone. Um, so before we uh, before we jump into um, more of a free flowing discussion, I uh, just want to, uh, at the risk of some eyes rolling, to mention the C word for a moment: the cost of living uh, crisis. Um, so obviously, a lot of what we're talking about need a long term, uh, long termist view, a long term strategy. But there's obviously this tension with um, a lot of short term pressures on the cost of living. Um, so yeah, really just want to ask the panel, you know, does that uh, does that change our approach to um, to making these arguments on net zero and, and should it change um, our no. approach? <laughs> no, so he, he knows, that, he's straight, straight in there with a no. No, it shouldn't be. It, it, the, the, ultimately, this is actually going to save us money and save the economy. And uh, I, 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 I like to say, I, I hear the experts coming back with, to me uh, saying that this is uh, going to solve so many problems with the cost of living crisis. We've, I, 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 I've just come from the French about warmer homes and the need to retrofit our homes, the need for insulation, um, and and the fact that there are there are families out there who are desperately in need of this support because they're having to choose between heating and eating. So. If we are to uh, actually solve the issue of cost of living crisis, we, we, we have to do this as well at the same time. You know, reaching net zero will solve the, the economic crisis that we're going through. Uh, so but it's a very simple answer. Yeah. Uh, well, do you want to yeah, I was just going to say, we've got, some, we've got some kind of direct evidence on this because we've been working with about 137, 137 community businesses over the winter around trying to navigate the cost of living pressures that are on them. And, and these are community businesses working in some of the most deprived parts of the, the country. And we've just had initial findings from some of our um, evaluation work suggesting that over 90% of those community businesses have developed or are developing retrofit and sustainable energy plans because they see that as an absolutely part of the solution to the cost of living, long-term resilience in the communities. It's the only way, it's not investing in North Sea oil and gas, I would say, trying to squeeze out every drop of you know uh, North Sea oil and gas. It's about moving away, transitioning away from these energy sources. And it's interesting that we're seeing that at the micro, local level and in community businesses as well. Uh, we're to come in. Uh, I mean, net zero requires big government, big government um, in terms of frameworks and ideas, but also we need government support, and particularly when it comes to making the transition fair. And, you know, we, we, we have forgotten a word like the public good, yeah? but the public good doesn't uh, come about through marketization of everything. The public good comes from a state that understands where we are going. Um, but this current government, of thirty years of conservative government, thirteen years of conservative government, have got completely forgotten this concept that there's such a thing as a public good or a public necessity. We need to get to net zero. Yeah, we've seen with the COVID crisis that actually the government can come in. If they see, see something as a crisis, but as has been said um, in public uh, campaigns before, when we were needing to do only this sort of little thing to switch from analog to digital television, suddenly yes, the government comes in with a very big gun. Yeah, sorry about that, that uh, word, but you know, with, with very big support for something that is absolutely in the public interest. Fighting the pandemic was absolutely in the public interest. 
Net zero is absolutely in the public interest. Where is the state? Where is our honesty about that we need a big state for this? Yes, we are liberal Democrats, but we also have to grapple with the thing that sometimes for certain things, while we be believe in liberalism, we believe in localism, certain things cannot be but delivered by the state. And net zero, to my mind, is very much that. And, you know, the Social Market Foundation will probably also recognize that, yeah? This is about a massive thing that we have to achieve globally. We have to achieve it on different levels. But unless we have governments that understand that support, set the guidelines, but also give financial support, we won't get that. And then what? Then what? It's not negotiable. So can I build on that just very quickly? Because I think it is that, and it's also long-termism. So we have just spent in the last year, or well, the government has spent, 40 billion pounds supporting households with high energy bills. That is a short term acute crisis. And where, where it, that crisis presents itself, the money is found. Right? Um, but when the next one crisis comes along, a high energy crisis, is there going to be another 40 billion? And why wouldn't you use some of that money to invest in retrofit and energy saving for the people who are most affected by that? So it's the ability to reconcile not just the big and the small, how big state works with localism, but also how you can essentially meet acute need, but in ways that prevent those things of emerging or coming up again in the longer, longer term. But, but also people say it's much more expensive to ruin the planet than to save it. The long-term benefits of all of this are very, very clear. But at this minute, we need more from the state than we are currently getting. Great. So um, I'll now open it up to the floor. We'll take um, three questions at a time. So uh, this lady at the front, um, do you want to um, go ahead? And... Yeah, sure. So <laughs> Mary Bright from Phoenix Group. Um, I've got one request for everybody that I'll finish with. Um, but why I'm here is Phoenix Group is the biggest long-term savings pension company. We've committed 20 billion over five years towards net zero, which is great, but we, and we want to be people powered. We want to invest locally, but we need local government to enable that. And the reason is, as a, as a pension company, we invest for long-term. We're about the long term. We don't need a fast buck. What we do need is to deliver security on those pensions for our 13 million customers. And that means we struggle to invest in very small local things. But with local government, we can create the securities that enable us to do that. And Lib Dems are brilliant at local government. So if we can work together that's how you can get the 20 billion the big money from big companies into small local investment so that's my ask for local government to work with big business on big investment at a local level can i just add to that and say that there is absolutely absolutely there's no we were talking earlier there's no shortage of money actually to invest in this but being able to do wholesale investment into hyper local stuff is really hard so you do need vehicles that actually offer the opportunity to do what you're saying but also to leveraging all sorts of different kinds of money and blend some funds together to create multiple outcomes and and you know have i would insofar as you can enable this sort of investment decisions being made very locally even though you've got really big investment going in so, yeah. So how we do that yeah. is, is the is the question uh, to explore that. Uh, yeah. Well, I've just got a real world example of that. It's great to hear you say that, Mary. Um, there's an initiative called Community Energy Together that's out there now, raising community shares to uh, purchase seven solar farms, generating enough electricity to power about thirteen thousand homes, and to critically develop, uh, deliver a twenty million pound community benefit fund. And this was an aggregated model, essentially, uh, and they brought in 31 million from pension funds to do that. And I believe it's the first time it's been done. So there is a live example of this happening right now that we'd be happy to talk to you about yeah. and that we, can, that we can learn from. It's key. I agree. So, can I just uh, add to that? I might as well. You might as well. <laughs> um, I think, I think um, there's really good opportunities for you to use, the, what, you know, essentially the Mayor of London and that kind of that approach, because the access that the Mayor of London has is, is London Council's 
and all of the, 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 the local groups that you're saying. So if we use the mayors and all the metropolitan mayors in this way, I think businesses can, can work a lot better with their local authorities. One of the challenges, and I, and I had a meeting with Port uh, of uh, London Authority recently, is that there are complexities uh, particularly for it comes, you know, for, for for them because of the river and the different responsibilities that each part of the river mm. has for local authorities and different ownerships and who owns what. So that's the challenge. It's actually knowing who's responsible and who owns what and who's allowed to do what when it comes to local authorities. I think that's where where businesses are really struggling to work out what what they're allowed to do. Um, that's when we need to have the government approach and and consistency across all our local authorities to give that 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 can that you know just to support them to really to work out who pays for what and who's responsible for what is that it is very challenging for people who businesses like yourself because the port of london authority are saying and also the environment agency have been saying to me as well is that the government right now will not pay you know, and it, and that we are relying on private businesses we're relying on businesses like you who've got the money to invest and make sure that we're achieving net zero. Uh, Vera, I don't know if you want to. Um, <laughs> no, I've already talked quite a lot. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we'll take another round of questions then uh, in the second row. So we're talking about a people power transition, but something that came across in the video was the sense of powerlessness that many people feel. And we know that with that can come to despair and anger, which then leads to. Um, resistance to to making changes which is already a difficult thing for human beings to do anyway they're, they're by nature creatures of habit and um, penal change with the exception possibly politicians tend to be more likely to change because that's what we go into it for um so how can we given that change does have to come at a government level and indeed an international level how can we square that circle and give people the feeling that there is a contribution that they can make and that they do have some power whilst at the same time recognizing we do need governments and across the world to act so we'll take a couple more uh at the back and then we'll come to the middle um middle of the seat here um alex Gunter from make um the um the transition is reliant on bringing the public on side and of course it reliant on the government uh, really pushing forwards uh, an agenda that, that, that can actually create change and support businesses. Um, as you're saying, this is really important in that in that cycle. Um, it seems to me the obvious answer to that is to, to bring in electoral reform and, and drive uh, <laughs> and create a new way that we engage with the people. Where are you going to do that, particularly from the Liberal Democrat point of view, if large parts of the population come on side and we need big campaigns? Like, how do we encourage businesses, particularly, um, to, to engage in that electoral reform? Um, yeah. And then over here. Yeah. <laughs> two of us from Make Post Master. I might want to say slightly different. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just want to say that, as, as someone I will know very well, um, there's a lot of evidence from around the world that uh, proportional democracies take faster action on climate change and uh, have better environmental legislation. And we're talking about the people powered transition. So, yeah, I'm really excited to hear from the panelists. Um, their, their views about the, the link between the, the people power transition that's that's needed and the, the, the movement for real democracy, like how, how do we bring those things together? Great, so uh, combating um, combating that sense of powerlessness and electoral reform. Uh, we're about to want to, uh, want to tackle that first. Make, make them to matter or the electoral reform society forum. I was a council mm -hmm. member. You know that I've always said um, uh, electoral reform is there for better democracy. Yeah, and if 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 the link is there, better democracy, democratic system. You know, it, 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 it is ultimately the will of a lot of people, particularly the younger generation, who probably have to bear the brunt of all the consequences of climate change, that we make these changes. So it's an absolute no-brainer. But, you know, if you ask me, <laughs> how we are going to deliver that to the change of government, and get the Labour Party yeah. on board with the electoral reform. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so that's the, 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 the difficulties that we are, we are, we are, we are still facing in, in, in that. But... In, in, in terms of, uh, you know, Claire, what you were saying about uh, the frustration, the anger that then actually 
backlashes. I think you, you're pointing to the biggest problem that we have. Therefore, we need to um, yeah, ma make certain projects tangible, and which is why I think, for example, community energy is one of these um, initiatives that are so powerful in order to engage with people, um, because not only are there benefits for the community, but it is also a big persuader of people to sort of get behind net zero and understand what the challenges are in a positive way. So, I mean, any, any community project, absolutely, I'm, I'm a massive favor. I've been spoke, I'm speaking so much about community energy. But again, you know, what is the government doing about this? We have to remember that politics is about choices. We've got a government who simply, you know, look at um, Rishi Sunak, just doesn't really think that climate um, change happens, it seems, or if anything, we can delay it. Well, that is just a terrible political choice. And the sooner we can get this government out of it, <laughs> the better. Sorry, that shouldn't go on to your... We'll bleep them. No, I don't. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, Kima, I yes. don't know if you want to uh, um, chime in. Well, on yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, it's, it, it, the, the, the conversation about the fact that we are going backwards uh, and our rhetoric is 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 so it's, it's stalling any progress is because of the fact that we are we have politicians who feel so stuck because of the electoral system. They're so worried, they're so concerned about not being able to win votes to get elected that they will not do anything radical. They will not do anything progressive. They will not do anything that actually helps people. This is a real problem. And so I absolutely agree, you know, electoral reform will be the only way forward for us to have any honesty in this in this discussion and many other discussions. Um, and, and when it comes to uh, community energy and, and projects, you know, obviously this, I know this is all your area, uh, but it, it, it's also the, 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 what I like about this approach is the education element. Um, is being able to get communities to understand the differences that they can make by making those changes. On business as well, um, I went to a recent conference of Business London. Uh, it was on the day of the announcement that Rishi was going to be making. The nervousness in the room, oh my goodness, it was awful. Everybody in London, all businesses, companies, financial institutions did not want to hear that, did not want to hear Rishi Sunak's message on, on net zero and, 20, uh, and, and that, that shift away from 2030. So already we've got businesses who are, who are working incredibly hard to make sure that they can reach the, the, um, the uh, you know, the, these objectives. And I'm going to just talk very quickly about something that I'm passionate about that I'm pushing in London at the moment, which is about a small thing, but it could make a massive difference. And uh, and please don't laugh, but it's all about cargo bikes. Has anyone been on a cargo bike? Love them. Love them. <laughs> um, and it, 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 it's a small way of me just really pushing the fact that businesses can adapt and change in a, in a small way, but actually it helps their business it improves the environment. It decreases the number of cars on our road, particularly in, in cities in like uh, in London, where we don't need to have too many vans out and about. Actually, those cargo bikes can get away, get get through London a lot quicker, um, and it's uh, it's the way forward. So there are things that are happening already that we just need to make it bigger and wider and shout about more. Um, but um, <coughs> you know. Lib Dems will do this, and we're doing it already. We're doing it in the London Assembly. We're doing it locally in local authorities. We're doing it with Vera uh, and in Parliament. We're, we're on message, and we're getting there. Um, it's just that we need to make sure that people realise that on the doors when they're voting, that that you know we can make that change. Can I ask uh, a quick question? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Has anybody in this room got a ground source heat pump or solar panels? Yeah. Five, five people. Excellent. So you'll have very first-hand experience of what that looks and feels like. Just wants to come back to your point about, um, uh, you know, how to stop feeling disenfranchised when these stuff, big stuff, is going on. For me, it's like there is definitely something about the empowerment it must feel if you're at a household level and you're able to put in a heat pump and know that you've got a sense of, of resilience in your household. Um, as climate change takes hold and we experience more extreme weather events that might be increasingly uncomfortable that you see people that have got stuff and you haven't. And I think the more we think about it as communities, as neighbourhoods, 
and less about individual homes and how we help in a more communitarian way our friends and neighbours and people that live near us may not look and feel and sound like us or even believe what we do but certainly can benefit from a broader broader kind of energy generation which I think is the way you're trying to get to is I think that's really important um I think it'd be very uncomfortable to be very very rich and secure in a world where most of the people around you uh, are clamoring to survive and we might find that is a nice instrumental way of thinking about more community action uh well just uh come to you to see if you want to yeah, I'll be quick, I guess, uh, to focus on how we empower people. I mean, I think as I heard someone say the, the, the climate anxiety, which is a massive yeah. issue, but a, a way of kind of flipping that around is actually it's 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 climate empathy. You know, the people, the reason that people are feeling anxious is because they're they're worried about the impact that climate change is going to have on them and their families, their neighbours, their community. It's, it's empathy. And, and the best antidote to that is action. And the place yeah. to do that is often your household or a local level. So we need to empower people to do that. We need to give them the resources to do that. We need to build that trust. We need to do some of the things I talk, talked about at the beginning around in terms of a, a community power act and the bright incentives and the framework. But I, I guess what's missing missing from this is the opportunity as well. Like there's a lot, of, obviously there are a lot of risks and challenges in this, but there's a massive opportunity. You know, Joe Biden is famous for saying, when I think climate, I think jobs. Well, I agree with you, Mr. President, but I also think about nature that's going to sustain us you know a livable future for my my children you know better public transport homes that are affordable and safe for everyone in the community you know a humane and kind of a coordinated approach to dealing with the mass movement of people around the world by the way because that's going to happen you know all of these things right you know we need to be thinking about this in a sort of long-term way and empowering people and communities at local level to, to play that role so we should hopefully have time for it uh, a couple more rounds of questions will come over here first, um, and then we'll go uh, around the back there, and then uh, and then in the middle. Hello, my name is Mark Scott. I help from Fair, I'm from Fair by Design, we exist to eliminate the property premium, extra cost for essential services. Now, I really agree with everything being said here, but I've just been reflecting on a, on a few bits like education, information, disenfranchisement, sorry, being disenfranchised, it cost me, disenfranchised. <laughs> We work with people in poverty um, in terms of co-designing new policies, processes, and, and products and services. We've got guides on our website for essential services. Um, and I think we just need to realise that for the poorest in society, and you mentioned deep points and things like that, absolutely in another world. And I think I'm, I'm just curious what the lived down position is around you know, that really difficult question of cross subsidisation, because given, I don't know, half price of a hit people to something in poverty it's not going to work this means massive cross subsidization either between customers or from taxation and i was just wondering <coughs> any thoughts on that so very quickly um uh, when it comes for example um, to investment um, for energy efficiency measures or changing your energy source for heating We've got quite clear policy around the social sector so if you're um, a social tenant then it's actually done for you. We also have uh, very clear ideas about how we incentivize the owner, the owner occupier. And what's really missing, and I hear that again and again, and we really need to put our mind to that before the next manifesto, is what do we do about the private rented sector? Uh, because an increasing number of people are now dependent on the private sector, uh, rented sector where the landlord has no interest in doing those improvements necessarily because there's no incentives for for the, for the landlord and they don't have to pay the higher energy bill. So um, I'm putting my mind to that, to be quite honest. Um, and I think it has to be a, probably a combination um, of a, a carrot and a stick, as we often do, uh, but, but some of it must be about incentivizing private landlords to do this, for example, setting it against income tax or something like this. I hear them people saying, oh, could we spend our money better? But I think um, since we have got a very large and increasing private rented sector and people are saying, the, the private rented sector said, oh, we're losing landlords now. I think we need to look at incentivizing something that makes landlords um, uh, do these improvements so that their, 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 their um, tenants can benefit, um, while at the same time um, also looking at some sticks um, of how we have a, a system where if, you, if, you're, if your property is not at least um, of an energy performing range of whatever it is, I know the EPC is, is rubbish but anyway let's say an epcc uh, then you can't rent out your property and that would rely on a local authority registration system 
we'll just get yeah, a couple more questions and then go back on panel. So over here, uh, Matt, back. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, my name is Richard Reed. I'm going to Mid-Eastern Stream Network. Um, I'm really struck by what you said about the sort of the government, what Helen said about uh, like a connection, communication, trust between people and government. Where it matters. Because we've been researching the past couple of years for our alternative security review, people centered security about what matters to people. And they feel one of the big findings from that, so one that you already care about climate change and worry about it, to a big lack of trust in government, in government corruption. Really surprising finding, maybe, but no trust in government. Without trust in government, you can't really have. Resilience or adaptation. But we have quite a mixed system in the UK, and the attempts are already into this. We have city governments in London, we have tax mayors, we have devolved administrations in various places outside England. So I wonder if there are any lessons from those different kinds of governments <coughs> about where that trust does exist and is built and is really useful in terms of building. You know, Adaptation, resilience. Yeah. I think we have, we have one more question in the middle. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Camila, head of Asian Affairs at Fairbright Design. So, same organization as Martin here. So, we are yeah, a program that exists in a approach group. So, as Martin said, those actual costs that people um, only come to pay for essential services, so things like insurance, credit, energy. So very recently we did uh, a report, so it was a participatory research project co-badged with OFGEM, and we worked with people with lived experience and their uh, lived experience of poverty to uh, ask them what a fair transition to net zero would look like. And we heard many things um, uh, from them, and one of the things was, for instance, that people were keen to adopt greener forms of heating, for example, but they couldn't afford the one-off cost. So that, I, that that's that's not news, right? Then on top of that, we have things like a poverty premium on the way people pay for the energy. So for example, I'm not sure if you're aware, but you, if you pay for your energy, every quarter on receipt of bill, you will pay an extra 200 pounds a year just because of the way you're paying for your energy. Now, my question is, or rather it's a bit of a challenge to the panel, are we looking at these very basic things uh, so that we can better encourage that people on low incomes to really uh, take part in, in, in this transition? Um, we know that we need to do it, and, and I agree with Vera that it's, this is not up for debate, but cost of living is a very real issue to real people on the ground. So how can we tackle those things alongside to just to ensure really that that transition is fair. Great. So just conscious of time. So I'll run okay. the panel and maybe, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so lots, to, lots yeah. to dig into there. I really wanted to go in the trust. And, mm. uh, yeah. and I'm saying this because of the, 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 the transition that we've tried to go through with you, Les, this is a, an absolute example of people losing trust and um, and it's such a shame because ULES should have been something that worked and was and 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 was a successful policy. It worked in inner London. Why didn't it work for outer London? Why is it? Why are we struggling right now to get it get that trust that this is the right thing for uh, for outer London? Well, uh, it's because of uh, unfortunately, if if politicians and the mayor of London did this, um, made a decision to put ULES through within a time limit between now and the next election, right? You lose trust straight away because what you've done there, you've made it really clear that actually you're, you're trying to do something quickly, push it through because, you know, he knows it's going to be controversial. He wants to win the next election. ULES before in, in London was long term, it had lots of time, there was lots of time for people to get used to it, lots of education, understanding why it was going to work, how it was going to work, and there was a structure already in place with uh, inner London having a good transport system and it was going to work. And then within the outer London situation, the lack of trust was built on the facts like that, and Sutton knows this, cuts, cuts to buses. Right? If you if you do one thing, make a cut 
to public transport and then say to people, now you can't use your car, you lose trust. And that's the problem. We can't have green transition and this transition that we all want if you do one thing that makes it more difficult for those people you were just mentioning who are struggling with the cost of living. It has to be fair. It has to be communicated well. It has to be done in a, in a, in a way that is enough time for people to make that transition <laughs> and that shift. Um, you have to invest properly before we do these decisions that are going to really make you know, a massive impact on businesses, for people who are carers, for, for nurses who need to get to work, for teachers who can't get across the border because they live outside of London and have to come in. You know, there are so many issues there, and that's the problem. Now, I think that the Mayor of London wasn't honest, essentially, and he should have been more honest with everyone and said, this is going to be hard, this is going to be going to take a long time, this is how we're going to do it. Is You know, we, we, we might struggle a little bit here and there, but it wasn't like that. And I think that that's the issue. That honesty that I talked about uh, and Vera's talked about is needed for us to have that real transition. Uh, Helen, I don't know if you want to. Uh, well, I, I agree with you to a certain extent, but I think the idea of like suddenly going paying paying nothing a month to two hundred and forty pounds a month just by dint of getting in your car and um, paying sixty pounds a week, I think that's. I mean, that's. I would have put it far lower. I think that. It may be about political expediency, but also I think just that affordability of being able to do that and go to naught to whatever is 240 on an average month. It's just incomprehensible for most people have to get in a car in out of London. Um, so I think that poverty premium and work affair by design is pretty fundamental to a lot of this. You know, it really is important work. But I think one just point is you have to have subsidies. There's no way you get to this without there being some, as you say, big government, very high levels. Uh, of public subsidy and making sure that it goes into the people who are most vulnerable and most poorly affected as we see that on a global scale where we have a global responsibility on the inequality that's uh, you know, people appearing having the impacts of climate change and people who are insulated from it we need to do that at a, at a national level too so there's no there's no getting around the fact it's going to cost a lot of public money no question at all great and uh well um so we've got, um, you're reaching the forest and society and uh, addressing that, that lack of trust. So I, on the lack of trust, point, I'll be very quick, I don't know we're at time, but um, I'd encourage you to look at uh, the model of local climate commissions, which have taken place in several places around the country. And the idea of bringing, you know, um, public, private, community, third sector partners together, essentially to design and commission and deliver climate action in the local community in a kind of coordinated way, coordinated way. And I think, you know, that sort of model is absolutely needed at the local level, as well as, you know, the right framework at the, at the, the national. I think on the kind of one-off costs and the short-term investment, we absolutely can't <laughs> shy away from the fact that it's huge. You know, we know that the benefits over the long term will, will accrue and the net benefit uh, for a transition net, net zero will be definitely be, definitely be positive. But there's a massive short-term investment. And I guess the elephant in the room, maybe it's not an elephant in the room, and I'm, this is certainly not power to change policy, but, you know, Fossil fuel subsidies, you know, big business, you know, there's 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 a way of financing this that I think we need to look seriously at. Fantastic. Um, we'll give the last uh, last word of this event uh, to. Oh my goodness. Um, well, no, no pressure. Um, well, I stand up again because uh, I, I remember that uh, uh, you can't all all hear. Um, so I said net zero is not negotiable, and there are some sort of scary mes messages around that, but that's the last thing that we need, that we are scaring our, our population. So it is about clear leadership, but also about positive messages that we can put out there. So I'd say for us politicians, it's about not being timid. Yeah, not being timid about the consequences. Be bold, but be positive about that. We can do this. I think this has been said time and again. We actually know what to do about net zero. The solutions are out there, but it is about political choices. And we need to hold a government to account that is currently failing and making the right choices. And when we are in government, if we are in government, but those who are in government and, and how we support a, a government as Liberal Democrats, to support those right choices is absolutely out there. We can do this. Let's be positive. Let's be bold, not be timid, not always retreating from what we actually believe is the right thing to do and get a message out there. Yes, net zero is not um, negotiable, but yes, we can achieve it too, and we can do it together, and we can do it in an equitable way. I think that's the most important thing um, uh, for all of us here, that we make this transition, transition um, fair, and we keep saying that as Liberal Democrats too. Mm -hmm.
Great. So on that note, I think we unfortunately have to wrap up as much as we could. Uh, we could talk about this for many hours. Um, so uh, thank you to all of our speakers. Uh,